All right, guys, so underway here in our round four feature match for each of these players are two and one. Cutting to a top four after this, so they need to win here. On the left, it's Adam Vickers. He's playing Ravel Red. He started off perfectly with a Foundry Street Denizen into two more Foundry Street Denizens. It's going to allow him to attack into 17. Or attack his opponent down to 17. His opponent is, in fact, Cody Niebuhr, who I have mislabeled. He's not playing Mono Green Devotion. He's playing Red Green Devotion. It's basically a Mono Green Devotion deck, which I believe is splashing... Um, red for Z uh, Planeswalker Xenagos. So pretty good t turn two for Cody as he can chain a Burning Tree into a Sylvan Karyatid. Here's three mana from Adam for a Goblin Rabble Master. That's going to trigger all of his Foundry Street Denizens. Token's going to come into play, pumping all again. They all have to attack because of the Ravel Master, so those are all three ones. The token is a 1-1. One, one. So Cody can pick off one of the Denizens, trade his Burning Tree, and he can block the token if he wants to. Take six, go down to 11, but uh, down to 11 is a lot better than down to seven. So a pretty strong curve from Adam here. Short and Ash Zealot on turn two, or not even, no, this is the perfect draw from him, actually. So, blocks as expected, Cody goes down to 11. Oh no, he trades his Karyatid. So, keeps his Burning Tree around, trades out his Karyatid, not even trades, just uh, chumps with the Karyatid, so that seems maybe a little bit suspect there, but... Uh, We'll see how it plays out for him. So there is a Voyaging Seder. Not going to do much this turn. Can trade with the Foundry Street Denizen. That's probably its most important factor right now. So we've drawn a Stoke the Flames. So there's a Firefish Striker. Trigger all of his Foundry Street Denizens. Move to combat. Triggers the Rabble Master. Triggers the Denizens again. Serve in with the team. Cody's had enough. He's going to scoop it. I don't think he's exactly dead there, but uh, I think he's just just not seeing a way out of that. It is pretty much the nut draw from Adam. Adam also had Stoke the Flames in hand, which was going to complicate any blocks anyway, or just go upstairs. So So game two underway, and Cody off to a good start with a turn one Elvish Mystic, and Vickers missing his one drop here. And the Red Green Devotion deck does not need a wide berth to start going pretty big pretty quickly here. So there's a Burning Tree Emissary. Chaining into nothing. So sketchy keep from Cody here. On the play with a one lander. He does have the ability to cast his Burning Tree Emissary on turn two, but nothing to chain into. So we'll see if Adam can take advantage. I think Adam's choice here is to play an Ash Zealot and attack for two, or to play a Burning Tree Emissary. That is the one uh, kind of non-bow with this deck, or at least the lack of synergy, which is that you can't chain you can't chain your two drops together if they are Ash Zealot and Burning Tree. So there is a Voyaging Seder that will effectively serve as another mana source for Cody, but he's falling behind here. Adam will now chain a Burning Tree Emissary into an Eidolon of the Great Revel. No, a Madcap Skills on his Ash Zealot, meaning he'll be able to get in for five here. And uh, Cody's deck is not well equipped to deal with uh, an enchanted creature, so Adam leaving those in. The Madcap comes out a lot against a lot of decks, as it is a liability to get yourself two for one, but against a Devotion deck that does not have a lot of removal don't have much of an issue. So Burning Tree chaining into a Courser of Cruffix. I need to reveal the top card. Not that it matters. So 
So there is a Rebel Master. So we move to combat, make a 1 1 token. It is the infamous Adam Vickers token. Serve in with the team here. So we're going to chump that. We're going to kill the Corsair and we're going to take five. But Rubble Belt Maka. Rubble Belt Maka on the Burning Tree is going to kill the Corsair. It's going to keep the Burning Tree around. So Adam really only loses his Goblin token. Cody's going to take five off the unblocked. Ashzel and go down to eight. So falling behind here. Got a course turn to play, didn't gain any life off of it. Cody in a world of hurt here. Tons of business in hand, but no lands to cast it with. The red deck is not one that you can stumble against. So Adam sends in the team, including the Rabble Master. Rabble Master is going to be a 3-2 because of the uh, trigger. So we basically, what do we want to do here? So there's three mana. What is that card? I have no idea what that card is. Apparently you can't cast it. So I'm not sure what Cody's that card was. I have a feeling it's a sorcery, and that's why Adam is telling me you can't cast it. So I don't think Cody feels real confident here. There's a lightning strike to finish things off. That game was won when Cody failed to find his second land. We got over a half hour left in the round here. If it's on the app, I have no idea what to tell you because the app is garbage. So bonus coverage here in round number four. We've got on the left Scotty right. He's playing the rock. We saw him earlier tonight. His opponent is his brother. Jonathan Wright, who's playing Esper Control. Scotty firing off a turn two duress here. Revealing Thoughts, he's two dissolves, a detention sphere, a Jace Architect of Thought, and a Muta Vault. So Jonathan on the mold of six here on the draw. With a little bit of a situation. Unlikely to have drawn a land there because he most certainly would have played it. And there's a Read the Bones. A card that comes out in a lot of matchups. A one of in Scotty's deck has it is basically a uh, in the vein of Reed Duke, splitting it two underworld connections and one Read the Bones, just for some variety. Read the Bones good in places where underworld connections is not, and vice versa. So Jonathan does top deck the perfect card in the basic island, does not have to take any damage, has Dissolve Mana up, has Detention Sphere up if he needs it later. We're going to get a thought seize here from Scotty, it looks like. First, we're going to get some information. Scry. It's a thinker, but eventually it goes to the bottom. Now, what does Scotty want to do? Does he want to trade a thought? Well, it just passes back. And there is a thought seize. That's going to get dissolved. It's going to get dissolved anyway. The thought seize would take the dissolve. So might as well get the scry out of it. Now, Scotty has his opponent tapped out. And he uses this opportunity to land an Underworld Connection. It's a very important card in this matchup. Jonathan's probably obliged to D-Sphere, and he does so immediately. Not allowing Scotty to dig for or to uh, benefit from card advantage. And there's a Thought Seize. Two Jaces, a Dissolve, and a Supreme Verdict. So Jonathan's hand is pretty juiced. For being stuck on four lands, he can cast all four of those spells. He has redundancy on his Planeswalker. Has the best removal spell in his uh, deck against Scotty. So we'll see what uh, he wants to do here. 
So Scotty does have an abrupt decay in his hand, which he'll use probably at the end of Jonathan's turn to get his connections back, and we'll still have a, a swamp untapped. So Jonathan, uh, so Scotty does take the dissolve. Jonathan is going to land a Jace Architect. I thought I think Scotty would take the Jace if there wasn't redundant copies. So Jace immediately takes down, revealing Thought Seize, Ultimate Price, and Dissolve. So Scotty splitting Dissolve and Thought Seize. Deciding where he wants to stick the uh, mostly irrelevant card in Ultimate Price. Well, it's not irrelevant at all. It's uh, just not as good as Supreme Verdict and... Uh, not good on this board. End of turn, as expected. Underworld Connections comes back as the Deep here gets abrupt decayed. Scotty goes down to 15 to draw a card off of his swamp. Let's see what his follow-up is here. He's got a demon in his hand. He might need to run that out there just to get a threat on board. I think he's going to go with Corsair, though. No, it's a Lifebane zombie, revealing another detention sphere. So Jonathan, all answers, all the time. So Jonathan debating what he wants to do with this Jace Architect of Thought. He reveals a land in hand. It's a godless shrine. What are we doing here? So three mana, four detention sphere. In response, go ahead and draw a card off the connections before it goes away. Hit under the sphere. So Jonathan leaving up mutable activation. More importantly, leaving up ultimate price to take care of the life being zombie to save his Jace. There is an Erebos. So Jonathan tapped low, so Erebos is going to resolve. And ultimate price takes out the life being zombie as expected. So Erebos, pretty good in this spot. Two detention spheres already down. And a mini factor fiction off of Jace reveals. Two shock lands and a scry land, so it's deck manipulation or the two cards. Jonathan going to choose the scry. Erebos, a potential win condition card advantage engine, and more importantly, shuts off Sphinx's Rev life gain. So, a great card in this spot. Mm. And there is a Mutavolt beatdown. Scotty is at 12. Off of Thought Seize and Underworld Connection. So there's a Courser of Crufix, revealing a Miscutter Hydra on top. <laughs> he reveals it and then turns it back over again. And again, Scotty has drawn a Golgari Charm. So he's going to be able to kill the kill this uh, Detention Sphere if he wants to, or at least make Jonathan tap three mana. As uh, Jonathan does have a Dissolve, to go along with Supreme Verdict and Jace Architect of Thought. We'll gain a life off of uh, Temple of Malady coming to play with the Courser Trigger. We're going to leave that Mist Cutter on top as it's one of the better cards in this matchup. So Jonathan draws for turn. He's got six mana. He has an active Jace Architect. He's got Counter Magic. He's got Removal. He's got a redundant Jace. A Mutavolt on board and a two unknown cards. Tick Jace up to two. Play an island from his hand. Now what does Scotty want to do? I think Scotty would wants to go Gary Charm. No, he's gonna draw a card with Erebos. Revealing a hero's downfall. Here's a force off the top, revealing a swamp on the top. So churning through his deck. At this point, I think we just cast the Mist Cutter and pound in here. One, two, three, five, six, seven. This Jonathan can't do anything about it. Oh, another.
other connections. What does Jonathan want to do about this? Is it going to resolve? Scotty revealing the two known cards in his hand. Both revealed off the courser. And Jonathan decides he really doesn't have another choice. He's going to just fall so far behind the extra card advantage that Connections has to go, plus the uh, Counterspell not going to be that good against the Miss Cutter anyway. And Scotty just passes back there. No attack, no nothing. Seems very weird. So let's get rid of this Jace. Revealing Verdict, Thought Seize, and Sideboarded Night Veil vale Spectre, which are deceptively good in this matchup. So it's Thought Seize and a Redundant Verdict. Oh, wow. So Thought Seize or no? The Redundant Verdict is uh, pretty low impact at this point. So it's Night Veil, Spectre, or Thought Seize. What does Jonathan want here? So we take the Thought Seize. Now we resolve the Thought Seize. So that Mist Cutter likely going away. Revealing a hand of Hero's Downfall, Mist Cutter, those we knew about, Golgari Charm, and two Desecration Demons. So Jonathan's not going to take the Demons. That Golgari Charm basically represents an Underworld Connection. It's also worth noting it represents two Devotion for Erebos. So we can start attacking next turn if we Charm end of turn and cast a Demon. Miscutter is a real nuisance, but we do have the Supreme Verdict. The, matter, the fact of the matter is, can we survive through the attack? Or is that amount of damage not something Jonathan is worth... Is willing to take or we could take the hero's downfall and defend that Jace Architect of Thought in our hand he does take the Golgari Charm so Jonathan has the same game plan since the start deal with connections in all ways possible so here is four mana for a Jace Architect of Thought going to draw some cards there's a Rev and two Scry Ryan. So it's a Rev or no. So we take the Rev. We are tapped low though. Scotty can draw two cards here off his Erebus if he wants to. He's going to draw one at the minimum. Goes down to ten. Draws the Swamp. Reveals a Land of Waste. He's just going to go to eight. Very aggressive with his Erebus. Revealing a Mutavolt on top. Draws the Mutavolt. There's a scry land. So four straight lands off the top for Scotty here. It's going to play the scry land, go up to nine. Shove a land war waste to the bottom. The card on top is another overgrown tomb. So six lands in a row for Scotty here. So we can attack with the Corsair and kill the Jace, save our hero's downfall. We're going to cast a Mist Cutter for three. So we can get him for three here, knock Jonathan down to 13. Kill the Jace. And this line will keep Jonathan from effectively casting that. Sphinx is Rev next turn as he's kind of obliged to cast his Supreme Verdict, meaning the Rev would only be good for one and that only if Jonathan has an untapped land. And Scotty does have 
Hero's Downfall mana up. And the ability to draw another card off Erebos end of turn if he doesn't need to use mana otherwise. So Scotty seems to have stabilized here. He's got his opponents on the ropes. He has drawn a lot of extra cards, both uh, physically off his Underworld Connections in Erebos and theoretically off of his Courser of Crufix. So here's four mana, four Verdict. So like we said, casting that Mist Cutter gets rid of, uh, or fogs that Rev for one turn. And Jonathan plays a Night Veil Spectre. In a turn, he's going to draw a card with his Erebos. We do not reveal the card this time, because the Courser has gone away. There is a Lifebane Zombie, revealing Aetherling, Elspeth, and Sphinx's Rev. The three best cards in Jonathan's deck, but... <sighs> Erebos is now live with the Desecration Demon in play. Jonathan down to 11. Yeah. Elspeth minus 3. Scotty reminding Jonathan that he has a Desecration Demon in play. He's obliged to announce that trigger before attacks anyway, but uh, also just reminding his brother that you probably don't want to attack into this giant guy. So Elspeth will deal with the demon, but it will not deal with the Erebos, as gods are indestructible. It is worth noting that there is one, uh, the Aetherling is a one-turn clock here. And Elspeth is pretty good at answering Desecration Demon. However, all of this is not nearly as exciting when we know that Scotty has a hero's downfall in his hand. More importantly, these two players up against the clock as well. As if Jonathan wins, it's irrelevant, but if Scotty wins, it's going to be difficult to get a third game in at this pace of play. So we play Elspeth, we start making tokens. We sack the demon, we get in with Spectre, we reveal a swamp, we play a swamp, turning on any ultimate price type removal in Jonathan's hand should he have it. We draw a card, or Scotty goes down to five, he plays a swamp. What are we doing now? So Erebos is alive here. We also have a Muta Vault. We play a Desecration Demon. We load up our Muta Vault. I think we just send the team in here. So we tap the Demon. It's now an 8-8. We have another trigger from the Demon. Seems irrelevant. Serve in with the team. Likely chump blocking Erebos taking five. If we have an ultimate price, we only take two because we can kill the lifebane zombie. Well, Scotty with the pump fake. Yep. He does decide to get in there. Scotty doing all of this with Hero's Downfall backup. What is Jonathan thinking about here? At 11 life, I don't think he really has the luxury of not not doom blading the uh, or uh, ultimate pricing the life bane zombie. What we're doing for sure is chump blocking, and we decide just to do nothing after that. So here's downfall finishes off Elspeth, and Scotty passes back. So we'll see what's up here. So Jonathan has a Spectre, has 8 mana, 
A Sphinx's Revelation and Aetherling and two unknown cards. One looks like it's a land. It is a Caves of Koilos. There's six mana, looks like we're going to... What do we need here? Do we need a rev for two and hope we... F oh, no, we're going to cast an Aetherling. I thought there might be a line where we rev for... Rev for two and try to find a Supreme Verdict. So just passes back Aetherling and Night Vale Spectre on D. We play a Lanawar Waste. We have two triggers. If we have a removal spell here, we kill the specter, announce our triggers, and then kill them with demons. Five minutes remain in the round. So we load up our Muta Vault. Jonathan has a Muta Vault in reserve as well. He's going to tap it, turn it into a creature, and sack it to the Desecration Demon. I have no idea what's going on here. In response to the activation, this guy's going to draw a card with Erebos. He's going to go to one, jeez. There's a hero's downfall on the Night Vale Spectre. It's going to do it on the Aetherling. So this should be good enough. Because we can phase the Aetherling out. Sack two creatures to our Desecration Demons, but still die to five, three, and two power creature from the rest of them. Unless there's a... Unless there's... And that's going to be enough, so I'm going to go make sure GB knows that we give these guys an extension because they didn't move for us. So hurrying through the game here. Turn one thought sees. Let's take the Night Veil Spectre probably. Yep. So just racing to try and find a way to win this game. Both players up against the clock here. Not sure if a draw does any of the, either of them any good. So there's a course there. Down to 17 off of Pain Land. Jonathan with no black mana currently, but he does have a deicide. But he's missing his third land. So there's another Corsair. Land on top for Scotty. It's a scry land. He'll go up to 18. There's a Muta Vault on top. He'll leave it there. Jonathan's stuck on two lands here. And shocking himself so he can leave dissolve mana up. So there is a Munivolt. We knew it was on the top of his deck, thanks to the Courser. There's a Miscutter Hydra on top, too, so it's got in a pretty good spot here. There's a Lifebane Zombie. Let's see if Jonathan wants to go ahead and dissolve it. He's in an awkward spot because he wants to not dissolve it and instead wants to cast Supreme Verdict next turn, but there's no guarantee that he's going to draw that land, but he's decided not to not to dissolve it. So 
There's Dissolve pushing a card to the bottom. Looking for a land. He needs an untapped land here so he can fire off that verdict. There we go. It's a Night Vale Spectre instead. It's going to get abrupt decayed. Oh, there's a Duress on top. So this is not going to pan out well for Jonathan here. Serve him for four. Get Jonathan down to 12. And just pass his back. So there's three mana for a detention sphere to take out the courser and just passes back. So there's a duress revealing redundant supreme verdicts. Might as well take one. There's a miscutter hydra four three, knocking Jonathan down to to nine. So we had to trade our verdict for the miscutter. It's our only answer to that card. Might as well do it now. Can't really wait around to get a card advantage out of it. So there is a Muta Vault. It doesn't have a color, so it cannot be ultimate priced. End of turn. Abrupt decay on the D sphere. Get the Courser back. There's the Underworld Connections on top. Drawn for turn. There is another Muta Vault. So serve in for four. Jonathan goes down to three. Looks like Scotty might find a way to win this one in the allotted time. And that's going to be good enough. So Scotty gets there. We'll go out and expedite things and move into our top four.